Starseeds are the guardians of Terra who hold the knowledge of our ancestors. They are the inner earth beings that come to guide us with their wisdom. They are the enlightened beings from all over the galaxies that come to Terra like comets of light. They are the pioneers, the way showers, and the architects of a new world. One built upon integrity, unity, and love. These are their stories. Join us as they share their journey of hope, as they break down paradigms and limiting beliefs, as they share their challenges and struggles to fit into the very society they are here to shift. The good, the bad, the everything. This is a journey of a starseed. everybody are you ready okay <laughs> hi everybody welcome back to my channel i am so honored today to be joined by a good friend of mine heidi pop thank you so much for coming on today heidi hi oh thank you so much for having me sherry this is a treat thank you <laughs> yeah it's a treat for me as well i've been looking forward to this so for those of you that don't know we'll, we'll have heidi introduce herself in a minute and give her background but i was on a previous podcast of hers raising star seeds maybe a couple of times in 2022, mm -hmm. or I don't even remember when it was, but I really enjoyed it. And we have a lot of very similar um, ideals on parenting. And, and so today's topic, we really wanna dive deep into conscious parenting, new earth schooling, um, 5D parenting, whatever you wanna call it. There's lots of names and lots of topics that we, we wanna get into today. But before we get into all of that, Heidi, do you wanna give everyone a, a brief background on who you are and what you're about? Sure, I will try. <laughs> well, I've, I've kind of lived all over the States. I am a childhood abductee and contactee, and I got that going for me. <laughs> but my mom um, really encouraged a lot of the spirit realm when I was young. I had a very magical childhood. And then my teens, tweens were a little more traumatic with as far as the contact and as far as um, the trauma behind that. And then everything went dormant for me. And I was just living my best life. I was having a blast. <laughs> Going through Chicago, I was always in motion picture or working with kids. Like I juggled those two worlds for a long time. And then eventually migrated out here to the West, to Los Angeles in 2000. And um, enjoyed my career. Continued to dapple in both teaching kids as well as working in motion picture. And um, again, my everything with as far as contact and spirit and things was dormant still. And then I had my kids. And then 2010, I had my daughter. And that was my, they are my catalyst to my new awakening, me um, finding a bit more about myself, um, just tapping into source more. They really brought out the mama bear in me because I became painfully aware of what the medical establishment was doing. And um, I went down all the rabbit holes when I had my first daughter and really just phew, everything expanded. And then by the time my son came around, um, I came back online as far as contact and source and um, experiences because he was having a very dark, similar experience that I was having in my teens. It was seemed very dark for him, night terrors. He was seeing um, reptiles in his room. Like it was, I had to study all that stuff again and it opened up everything again for me. And um, then by the time, I mean, they're, they're almost 13 and 10 now. And now there's a big piece in the home. We um, work at a learning, I work at a learning center where they go to school and it's very new earth, you know, conscious parenting kind of place. Just a couple days a week, we're homeschoolers. I dove into that world and I'm kind of merging all my loves, but I'm back to the heart of it all. There's no more fear. There's a lot more protection. There's, um, we're trying to find, be way showers of how to navigate the crazy 3D life, but in the heart-centered um, family unit kind of way. You know, I, I feel in touch and in tap with other worlds. And I think it's a beautiful thing. I don't think it's a scary thing anymore. And I want to teach them that as well. So we're just kind of navigating Los Angeles right now and all the 
Um, we don't subscribe to any of the mandates or any of the craziness. So I feel like we're here for a reason to light it up and find the others. And that's kind of what we've been doing. We've been finding a lot of community members who as well are just like, there's more than this meat suit than this here, right here and now. And I think we should be teaching our kids that. And so that's kind of where I'm in the middle of it now. That was a quick synopsis, but <laughs> I think I covered a lot. <laughs> yeah, you did, you did. And if anybody watching this wants to see a great interview of Heidi really going into depth in her, in her background, uh, I suggest watching Robert Earl White's interview from a couple of weeks ago. It was fantastic. It was a great interview. I thoroughly enjoyed it myself. So go back and watch Thank that. You. But our, our objective today is a little bit more focused on, on children and parenting. And so we're, we'll, um, what, one thing that you mentioned was really is an, an important point, I believe, is spreading your light where you're needed. And, and I work with children all over the world and parents and, and adults that don't have children. And I feel like this message is being repeated over and over again it's like you're where you are for a reason you're you either move to that area for a reason or you're staying where you are for a reason because we need to anchor in the light in the dark places too we can't just abandon ship yeah. in all of these pockets of the world that seemingly are the darkest because we need to anchor in the light it, and it makes a really big difference so you happen to be in a, in my hometown los angeles um which in, in my heart has always been oh that's my home um but i was really kind of drawn away from that area for various reasons. Uh, and, and I was in the, the East Coast for, for quite some time, um, but I, I know that my energy was also needed in the East Coast, which is also very thick and dense and dark, at least where I was in the DC metropolitan area. And so I was always told, you're where you are for a reason. Your children, are their, their light is needed here too, because they affect the children around them. And, and it's, it's a beautiful synchronistic Kind of web of energy and if you look at it from a, a perspective like farther back as opposed to like really up close it's quite dynamic and and beautiful so i'm glad that you brought that up because i think it's important oh it's huge and i think that was the catalyst too for me sticking in motion picture industry so long because it was over 30 years in some shape way shape or form i was involved and I knew I'm here for a reason, like this is for a reason. I just been talking on different um, shows about that as well, because it's it's imperative to not let it just burn down. We just have to try to flip it within and allow others to activate because there's some that are in the systems, whether it's motion picture or public schooling or something that are there as well for a reason. And we have to honor them. You know, it's still honoring them and their journey and they're activating somebody at some point. They just are. So yeah, or they're holding the space for it. Yeah, you know, we yeah. keep talking about the paradigms breaking down, but we still need the light within those paradigms to to assist in the change of the energy and the trajectory and transmuting the dark to light. So we need we need us in the education system, in the medical system, in the movies, because it's not like they're going away. We're just shifting them to another another energy, uh, another resonance, and so. We're, we're catalysts of that. And so that's that's really important to mention. So I love that you're in LA and, and changing my my home um, for a positive. <laughs> and now I'm here down in Florida. So we're all where we need to be for a reason. And that's that's the important part. But what I wanted to get into, Heidi, is conscious parenting. Because, you know, I, I, it's interesting. I've always innately been a different kind of parent um, than, than I was raised. I always looked at things completely different. And my mom said to me when I was, I think at this point I had my, I have three children and I think at this point I had all three and she gave me the, my, the world's greatest compliment I've ever had my entire life, which I talked about on, on Robert's channel, where she told me, I wish you were my mom, Sherry, um, which was the greatest compliment That's I've so ever sweet. received from somebody like she, she's like, I wish you were my mom because she sees how I do do things differently with my children. But on the flip side of that, she has made comments in the past, like, what is this free range parenting about, you know, like because she saw how drastically different I would up, like, you know, would treat my children or punish or not punish my children, it, it's things like that. And I always thought, oh, is that a bad thing? Because I felt like it was an insult, but it wasn't really an insult. She was just noticing a shift in energy. And now in hindsight, I look back, this was probably five, six years ago, and now we're calling it this conscious parenting. And so I would love to get your perspective and your thoughts on what does conscious parenting mean? What, what, what is that? And how do you create the boundaries of allowing your child to be who they are, their authentic self in this new earth mentality, but also creating some, or maintaining some sort of boundaries and structure, because we still need that. 
and it's a delicate balance, I think. So, so what are your thoughts on that? Oh, it's definitely delicate balance. And I'm really going through it hard right now with my daughter and the teen going into tween phase. So I'm glad you brought that up, but well, to me, conscious parenting, yes, I think it's putting the mind, body, will of the child, you know, making sure your children are lined up as well. I, I'm glad you brought up your mom too, because yes, my mom raised me with the imagination and different realms and enjoy the beauty of it. But as far as like childbirth, uh, breastfeeding, you know, ma- the jabs, all that stuff I had to learn on my own. She was not in that world. So to, in- to incorporate all of it, like keeping the lights turned on, <laughs> keeping their body clean and clear and healthy. Um, But more than anything, I think kids have not been given a voice. They've been, you know, suppressed in their own right. Oh, they're just a kid. And what happened with my kids and me, they went through a lot of trauma when they were little because their dad, who they chose to go through, both their dad and I, um, he was not around a lot. There was a lot of traumatic events. So watching them react to the situation I put them in, I no longer thought, well, they're just a kid. They're not going to remember this. They're, they won't, they can't see this. They can't hear this. None of that. I was very tuned into them and I'm like, oh my gosh, their nervous system or, oh no, you know, they're, they're stressed and they're taught. Like, I became very acutely aware of their who they were in this world. And it wasn't just, they're just my kids and I'm good. They're going to look cute and have manners. I was like, I want good humans. I want them to be kind and conscious of others and tap into the spirit world as well. And so I just became very aware of the lifestyle I was living, the people I had around me. Um, I, I knew public school was an option because I came from that world. So when the education was coming around, I was begging for something different just to keep their light on and keep their excitement to be children, uh, you know, around. Um, and my mom actually introduced me to, she goes, you should check out Rudolf Steiner and Waldorf. So I really followed that for a little while. Um, but to get to back, back to the point of the conscious parenting, I became very aware of who I was in, as a role model for them, not just their mom. But I became aware of who was in our our world, too, and what like their dad had this way of suppressing them as well. Like uh, with this Armenian culture, it was sit, sit over here and say, you know, don't say anything. And I just was like, "Ah, I got to I got to step in here. And I did. And I caused some chaos. We separated we, we, he's no longer in our home, but they flourished. I gave them a voice. I gave them a place, you know, somewhere that they knew they were heard, they were seen. And, um, um, I'm probably, I think, feel like I'm going off topic, but it's not because it's, it's really all about their spirit and their, they all have missions themselves and they all come in with so many profound gifts as well as contracts. My daughter is a victim of, a damage. I thought I was spreading things out and doing the right thing. Um, when she had a seizure in my arms at four months and the medical community would do nothing about it, I felt on my own. And I felt like, I'm so sorry you were a guinea pig for me for to learn this stuff. But in hindsight, that's what she was. I had to go through that, through her, to activate myself and study and research and really pay attention to what the health of the child is. And then, um, then we started the school system. How is their social? Like I, they're like my little guinea pigs <laughs> of just creating this beautiful sacred space for them. Um, sorry. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that was perfect. <laughs> and you know, <clears throat> from my perspective, what you just said about, about her and the seizure. And as a result of this, you know, to me, uh, I'm like, well, she signed up for that because it was part of your learning, you know, and, and they do that for us. They, they, we yeah. sacrifice and they sacrifice and many sacrifice in order for us to learn uh, because they become catalysts or they facilitate our learning or the next step. And I love how you said that your children were your catalyst of your awakening because they certainly were for me and each one seemed to wake me up a little bit more and change me in some, some way because they all have their own energy that they come in with and it characteristics and they can it kind of uh mirror what it is or model what you're working through and i think that it's a beautiful thing and i love that so uh, one you know one question i get a lot is because a lot of the new earth children tend to be very i call them spirited they're very spirited they're very strong-willed 
you know, they come in here with a purpose and they know it. So they know that their the school system is, is wrong. They don't they don't have the words to articulate exactly, but they know it's not right. There's something wrong with it. They they have a different outlook on life and they're they're no they're they don't have any worry about saying it or saying no or why does it have to be this way? Or, you know, they, they ask a lot of questions. And some parents that are more old school look at them as they're bad children. They're, they have behavioral issues. Oh, you should just spank them into sense or whatever they say. There's a thing. And I'm like, no. Um, yeah. So we got to figure out a way to navigate these challenges of these spirited children because they're here to teach us. They're here to wake us up and knock us on the head so that we look at things differently. Um, do you have any, what are your thoughts on that, first of all, and what are your recommendations or you know, what are your, what are things that you can um, help guide other parents that are having these issues and challenges in their house with these spirited children that are just exhausting? <laughs> oh gosh. Oh, well, the, the first thing that comes to mind is my favorite little hashtag of finding the others. It's just finding some community or maybe some other spirited children as well, and just getting them to do some sort of activity together. But if this is in your home, that's where we practice our patience. <laughs> like my son very much so can test me in that sense. But when I take a moment and say, I've got 10 minutes here to really hush myself and give him the spotlight and hear him out. And he's a genius <laughs> and he's quite entertaining. But I had to train myself to put down my phone. I had to train myself to focus be, and give them my undivided attention, even just for a blip, and then give them boundaries and say, well, now I have to move on to my next thing. But give them the stage for a second, and they can get this thing out, and then they're all good. <laughs> and that's just with him just needing to express an idea or a dream or, um, do you know what I did today or something? I think it's so easy for us to go, just a minute, just a minute, just a minute. And I used to do that a lot with how busy things were getting. And um, it's not current days to slow down we're we're all speeding up really fast not just with our activation and ascension but with this stuff tech and what's going on in our world so he's reminding me to slow down the faster he goes the slower i i slow down and then we have this beautiful moment that it's like time stands still and then we move on and it's like he gets that energy out that's just the first thing i thought of but uh, the other thing that i'm thinking of is grounding i got really into grounding them like during the 2020 2021 and i even got us to the point where we're on, on all fours in the grass <laughs> and i'm like breathe because <laughs> we just didn't know what was stuck and i was telling telling them let mother nature and let the planet help us push it through then we brought in a little key gong. This is when we were doing our little homeschool pod um, when we were in between schools and the world seemed to be shut down, but we were still going on. I'm like, how am I going to do this? And I got to bring in a little some Jedi stuff. But that alone, uh, we, we each have an equal voice in the house, too. I'm the mom, but um, I honor what they have to say and I give them a place to say it. And if there's boundaries that need to be checked like this, like I'm like, I'll be back in an hour, <laughs> you know, get A, B and C done boundaries. Just let this be. But know that after that hour, when I have been on a screen for an hour, I'm going to be I want to hear what you have to say. Let's dive into we're going to the library like we have things to do. So they know there's a plan for my time. Um, I don't know if that would answer. I got really excited to talk with you. So I'm all over the place today. <laughs> I'm the same way. I have like a million ideas that come in and it's just like vomit of the mouth. You know, you're just That's like, it. Because when you're talking about something that you're passionate about, it's so hard to like yeah. narrow it down to like one person has a question, gives you a question. You're like, how can I answer that? We could talk about this for hours. You know, it's I so know. funny. I'm the same way. Right. But do you mean like actual things we do like activities? Cause that would be like the grounding and yeah. Oh. Yeah. Well, you know, what's funny. Let me tell you something really quickly. When you said that I was laughing back in the day, if someone heard that they were grounding their kids, that they, they would oh, yeah. think you're grounding, like they're in trouble. I'm taking your video games away for a week. Like I would get, you know, I got grounded back in the day. And kids that like is taking on a whole new meaning of, and I like that because now we're flipping it from grounding to something positive. Like let's go outside and ground ourselves. So I think the language, it, the, it's funny with the language. Yeah. You know, one time my child, my kids were really upsetting me so much because they were just pushing me to the limit. And I said, you guys are so lucky that you don't get that. I don't spank you. Mommy used to get spanked back in the day and it was not fun. And, you know, when I was, when I talked back, my mom would spank me. And my son looked at me, he's like, 
mommy, what is spanking? And I was like, oh my God, like they don't even know what it is. Like they have it so good, you know, because I, it, it's a different mentality there. So like, you know, yeah. people are trying not to just hit their kids. They're trying not to just say no, because I said so. They're not, they're, they're, they're grounding them and sending them to their room. It takes effort and patience to give them a voice, but I think it's paying off because they are so incredible in what they have to say. And I always tell parents, you know, they're working with the cognitive development that they have. They might be an ascended soul, but when they come through here, they're still human and they need the vocabulary or the way to articulate how they're feeling. And sometimes it's really hard to do that. They get frustrated and they act out as, as a result of that. Sometimes all you need to do is just take, let's take a break, a, a breather or a break, calm down, let them formulate their thoughts and give them a chance to say what they're trying to say yeah. in an environment where they don't feel like they're rushed because mom's like, what, what do you want? Yeah, yeah. You know, they're like, oh, you know, I know like, I've done that too. I'm also very clear about, um, when there, there is a crazy bum rush of energy and I can't, I'm like, this is just spastic. I'm like, I'll sit there and tell them, I go, what did you eat? <laughs> and I go, what? And they're like, huh? And, and, you know, we'll find the culprit of, I'm like, cause you're, we just can't get you like what's happening. And these are also kids that, you know, they, they started young with Steiner with R Rudolf Steiner, who does talk about the body, body, mind, will of the child. They never had the public school. They never had this grading or homework or grounding. They had, I, I, I respect the imagination my mom gave me, but I also learned a lot of things of what not to do back in the day too. the grounding, the um, just zip it, that kind of thing. I'm like, no, I want to, have let him have this closure and tell me what he has to say um give them outlets too i'm like well write me a note if i'm not hearing you clearly tell write it draw me a picture what are you trying to tell me or something of these things that my mom we didn't we didn't do that but when that energy gets crazy i do get blunt with them i'm like we got to work this out let's go for a walk or oh my gosh red dye 30 did it again or 40 you know <laughs> and we're just blunt about it and they're like oh yeah i had that thing at so and so's house i'm like Let's work it out. Let's steam it out. <laughs> we talk about yeah, all think, that kind of stuff. I, I think the boundaries are important too. I like what you said. It's all about letting them know mom is in charge. Dad is in charge or whoever, whomever the caregiver is, but you do have a voice and it matters. You know, it's all about respecting. If you don't respect them, how do you expect them to respect you? And that's something that I always think about every single day. I give the, I try to honor them and give, but at, ultimately they know mom's in charge and I have the last say, and you know, I have to put them in their place sometimes. So, you know, people think conscious parenting is you let your children walk all over you and they are running around the store and you can't control them. And I'm like, no, actually, when you have a child that understands what you want, because you've spoken to them, you've talked it out. You don't just say no, they're actually much better behaved for the most part. Yeah. Right. What's the teen tween thing I'm going through now? I noticed she was going inward and I'm like, I got nervous because I'm like, she's going to get confronted with tests and I want her to be able to come to me. So I'm like, how am I going to make myself approachable without being like, are you okay? Are you okay? Okay. Talk to me. Something's wrong. So I just had to, I've been navigating this slowly and I've started with healing some of our past. I've humbled myself. I've apologized for having put her in those stressful situations when she's young and just having those discussions alone, you know, you see a release, there's tears, there's recognition. And it doesn't matter how far back it goes. It's like, remember that one time when I really didn't hear you or there's apologies that were happened. And then all of a sudden she's opening more. And then there's a lot of just listening um, because I know she was sometimes afraid to come to me because she Sometimes they don't want to know your opinion. <laughs> they just want you to listen, listen and hold space with them. And that was hard too, because I, I have to fix this. This is my daughter who was hurt when she was a baby and no one helped me and I have to fix this. I had to learn as a teen, like, I don't have to fix everything. She needs to figure out how to fix some things. I just need to be there for her. Even if it's just side by side physically, like tell, talk to me, you know, just that was new for us because um, I, I just... I mean, even even my folks, they couldn't help it. Okay, well, do something else. If that's bothering you, just do something else. And I, with her, I want her to make sure she has closure on something that's bothering her, whether it's the social aspects at school or whatever it is. Yeah. Well, when your child fears you too, they aren't going to tell you anything. And I always tell people, I mean, when I was, I was scared of my mom, most people are afraite of their parents, you know, especially the, gen, the older generations where, you know, they, 
you got in trouble, you got hit, you know? Um, and no, no disrespect to them. Like they're just going off of what they knew. So what they're good, they're, you know, most of them are good people. They just, that's all they knew. Uh, that's what they got too. Um, but when they respect you and they don't fear you, I don't want my kids to, I always tell my husband, I don't want my kids to be afraid of me. I don't want that. Cause then you hide things. I remember hiding things from my mom because I was like, oh my God, I'm going to get in trouble. I'll do anything I can to not let her find out. Um, and I don't want my kids to do that. So I try to, we have a rule in my house. You won't get in trouble if you tell me the truth. What happens is instead of punishing them, we work through it and, and they, they, uh, they appreciate that because they don't actually, I don't ground them. They don't, you know, like maybe I'll say, give me your phone. If, if, if there's something going on, I'm like, give me your phone for the rest of the day, you know? But it's, it, it's about talking through things so that they don't feel like they're going to get in trouble. And then they, 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 that, that's how they learn to lie, you know, yes. because they're protecting yeah. themselves. Lying, that's my biggest, that's my pet peeve and something I've worked through my whole life, trusting people. And so, and it's not to be dismissed. We got to bring up the woo-woo because sometimes I've hit them up with, I, I'll just go like this, like I'm reading them. And they'll tell me something. I'm like, mm-hmm. Like, I'm like, you know, I can read your mind, right? <laughs> And they're like, <laughs> but then I'll teach her like, but you can read mine too. <laughs> and then we play with that. But the the truth and transparency, I think is huge because I want them, yes, to know that there are boundaries, um, but it, it gets them, them consciously thinking they're making conscious decisions. They're thinking of repercussions versus, you know, immediate reward or a rush of chemicals that just like the screen thing, it's just a dopamine hit. And I will be like, well, let's all take, go get our hits. <laughs> I'll tell her we all, let's go check out for a little bit. I watch a bad reality show and they game for a little bit. And then I'm like, back to the Monopoly back to, game. Back you know? to life. Back yeah. to life. <laughs> I love that. You know, it's all about balance. You know, extreme parenting tends to result in children that misbehave because they rebel. So, you know, it's all about exposure and just letting them just, you know, have a little bit of everything. <clears throat> and, and I think that that tends to work really well, at mm -hmm. least in my does, I think, for the most part. But, you know, one of the things that I'm dealing with a lot and, and in your interview, it actually made me laugh. You you said in, in Robert's interview about how at night you would see scary things and you would put the covers over your face so like only your eyes were showing and like your and the pillows over your head. And I literally <laughs> laughed out loud because my daughter does that every single night. She she well, she suffered from night terrors and attack, psychic attack. And I've done a lot of work with her and I slept with her for years. And now every night she falls asleep in my bed um because I go to bed early. And then when my husband comes to bed around 11, 12, he wakes, you know, wakes her up. She's half asleep. And then he brings her to her bed and she's okay with that, but she feels safe. But even next to me in my bed and mom's baby, you know, mom's big bed, she has the pillow here, covers up to here. Sometimes it's, it's, there's no, I can't see her. I'm like, where is she? You know, and that's how she feels safe. Or she'll build a pillow fortress around her one here, one here, one on top of the head. And I'm like, when you said that, it made me laugh because I'm like, oh my God, I did that too as a kid and then she's doing that. Um, but what are your, do you have any suggestions for parents that have their children like your son seeing yeah. things or having night terrors? Like, how did you handle that? Sure. Yeah, well, sure. Side note, I still do that <laughs> with my pillow and my blanket. Um, yes, for him, it wasn't <laughs> until, because it started as a baby and that's when it was scary because I couldn't wake him. And I was really like, what is going on? And then toddler started coming and he started to be able to speak and tell me, you know, there's a lizard in my room trying to scare me or he'll be fixated on a corner and then get freaked out. And then it goes away and he'll try to tell me something's popped, something scared me and went away. And then I'd have to armor up. And so when the dreams were intense, that's when I dove into even there's a little mini copper pyramid over his head. He's got special crystals that he's picked out that he felt called to. Um, we do. Um, we started this. I do not consent at night to say I do not consent. But then the old preschool teacher and me came about and I go, well, what do we want then? And even my little galactic man, my little Cairo man brought it up. And he's like, you know, 
make sure he's calling out what he does want to dream about or where he does want to go. Because um, I do think we don't have to travel every night if we want to stay in our bed. And so the positive affirmation of I, I want to fly tonight or I want to visit Pop Pop or I want to, you know, we're starting to throw in something special so that he can go to dream with a positive memory. And um, reading before bed is help, but that took him learning how to read. So now that he's reading, I find that he's getting a peaceful slumber. But um, we also limit, there's a little white noise, but we limit any kind of, I mean, there's all the tech is in a different room. You know, he does have a bark phone or like those kind of things. Everything we just put in another room. And um, uh, he has his ritual. I noticed what he does. Like even after I tuck him all cozy in, he's got to go to the bathroom one more time. And that's his routine. And I wait so I can tuck him in one more time. <laughs> and there's often, if there's a rough day and we've done all the things we can do, we'll either do 432 Hertz music, like some background or binaural beats or something. Um, or there's this really lovely, um, was it Horizon Kids, a meditation story. And there's one in particular that he's fascinated with, and it's called the Dream Maker. And it knocks him out pretty quick. But it's either the Hertz or Dream Maker when it's like, okay, we've had a challenge or like we were at an event or coming home really late and he's wired or something like that. Those things are like the immediate, those are like NyQuil. <laughs> <laughs> but the other things are daily. It's like he makes make sure his crystals and things are in alignment and, you know, the pillows are just so he doesn't cover up, but he does make a fort a little bit. Yeah. And then he calls in what he does want. <laughs> mm -hmm. And he, the closet, the closet, the window, everything's got to be a certain way. Oh my gosh, mm -hmm. my daughter's the same way. The can't shut her door. The clock, everything has to be exactly before I, you know, you can leave her in there. Did your daughter, you have two children, right? Did your daughter yeah. suffer from that as well? Any nightmares? Not so no, much. she's an amazing sleeper, but she's the one who suffered most from like anxiety and stress and tension because of the situations with her dad and I, um, we had to clean up the max damage. And, um, she also was an, gifted it's a gift but not to a little girl but 10 11 9 10 11 she started really blossoming and maturing very early and then the moon cycle started at 11 and like older than all her friends she developed this figure that you know we went to beaches and older dudes were like it was too much for her little brain so she's got so much on her plate now we're just figuring out who she is, you know, she's, she, she escapes though, and she finds solace in art. So she is big into art, she can be found sketching anytime. And that's, I noticed how when she started to get more comfortable in her body is when she was able to release through art. And um, so yeah, those have been her stepping stones is just this 3d meat suit. <laughs> she doesn't travel, I don't think at night, maybe, but she's also the best sleeper in the house. She has my old bed, though. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's important to find them things that they can do that they can channel their free fears, frustration, happiness, all the, all the emotions, they can channel it through some, some sort of activity, some like my daughter's so crafty and, 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 and imaginative. So she's always mm -hmm. creating something, drawing something, writing something. She's like now into writing her own songs and, and playing on the piano. She doesn't know how to play piano, but she's just, she sings. And then she cre now she's creating lyrics and making it. And I'm like, wow, you go, girl. Like, I don't know where she gets that from. Not for me. Um, but then, like, my son's more analytical. And, like, he'll, he'll, like, use his brain. And that that makes him happy. You know, some kids have fun doing math. Whatever it is that your child likes, it's all about letting them be who they are. And no child is, is the same. And that's the tricky part is people try to one-size-fits-all approach to their, their children. You can't do that. Like you have to let them be who they are and they are, they could be completely different than their sibling. And we have to honor that and create space so that they can all have those things um, to make them feel comfortable in who they are. And so I imagine your children are different, right? Oh, they're, they're night and day. They, we even had someone ask us this week. Um, so they have different dads, right? And I'm like, what? I go, no, they, they, they're such different personalities that people forget their brother or sister. 
um, we have a stepdad that did step in and he came into our life in 2018. We eloped in 19 and something shifted in all of us. But for all of us, it was definitely security and comfort and just a little bit of just like, okay, we're, we're safe now. Mom's safe now, I should say. So the, everybody relaxed a little bit and then bloomed a little bit more into their own. So they, I saw a shift in all their personalities. They just became more into like individually into themselves when he came around. But like my little man um, for, hu for human design, he's a generator. So he's just like, <laughs> let's go. What are you doing? Tell me where to go. Tell me what to do. Give me something to do. And my daughter's just everything she ponders and observes and she's a feeler she feels so much she's such the little feeler of other people's energy too so with her i've been working with when you go into crowded space you know how to kind of protect your energy and also be mindful of who's trying to get your energy and those little modalities we're working with whereas my son i just trying to like we're trying kung fu tonight we haven't even tried that yet i'm like let's go try that it's a complimentary class i'm like you might like this <laughs> and he's like okay let's go um whereas my daughter's like no she would be fine in her room drawing the entire day and even making avatars online she'll do if she gets her screen time she chooses sometimes to create online too not just sketching so i'm like she's such a safe little bundle in her room and my little man's like can i jump off the roof <laughs> what will happen <laughs> you know like yeah, he's yeah. just an adventure guy <laughs> I love, that. I love that you just you got to go with the flow of your children and you and remember they're here to not only heal us but teach us to get us out of our comfort zone to encourage us I did a couple sessions the other day back to back I had two boys that I worked with I think one was seven almost six and one was nine or ten I can't remember but back to back I was like these they're incredible boys and they were both like I felt like they're here put on earth just to make people happy and to remind them of to be the joy in life and to and experience and to have fun and be in the present moment. I mean, both of them were just so dynamic, such beautiful souls. I was like, this is where we're going. This is what the world is about this. They're here to show us to be less uptight, you know, and to uh, just relax, not take everything so serious and enjoy the little things and go outside and get dirty. It's okay. You know, and, and I love that we, and they're here to teach us all of this. And which brings me to my next point, or I guess topic, mm -hmm. and one of the reasons why you and I are, are so uh, simpatico um, is the schooling. So you had originally reached out to me to come on your on your Raising Star Seed show because of what I'm doing with Aramis and mm -hmm. the center and, the, and education. But you have found yourself in a beautiful location in, in Los Angeles where you have now started working there. Can you tell us about this beautiful center or school or whatever it's called in your area, how you got there, what it's like, how you became a teacher there or, or staff? And tell us about that, because I want parents to know from somebody else how incredible the opportunities and the possibilities are with children. When we take the norms of the public school and you just break them out of that jail and what we can do with our children and how beautiful it can be. Like, I, I want. Mm -hmm. I would love for everyone to hear about what you're doing. Oh yeah. Well, I, I think it's special too that it is in LA, and you just wouldn't know that because there's so many. This the narrative out there is you know the mandates we have and how restricted everything is, but because of that, so many of these choices popped up. So it was like 2020, our old school um, lockdown. It was it's a Waldorf. Then when they reopened the next year, they they went with this, and I'm like, this doesn't align at all. Um, where's the other places? And I tried it on my own for a bit, but one of my good soul sisters, um, she's one of my, my closest friends. She's acupuncture energy, does the works. And I trust her and our daughters are little star seed friends too. Um, she goes, we just found this place. We started, this is up your alley. You might like it, you know, go tour it. You're not going to believe it. It's like you go into a portal in another dimension, even the campus. And they didn't lock down either. They were, it's like basically a small business. And um, so by 
fall of, I forgot when we start, actually started fall of 2021 to go into 2022, I went and I was like, oh, it exists, <laughs> you know, and it was for homeschools, homeschool kids. So they, they basically are an enrichment center for homeschool kids to go to, to get that classroom experience, to have um, educator and a curriculum and a routine in place for them, as well as some enrichment activities like string instruments and art and movement and things and gardening. But then they have the rest of the week to do more enrichment or private tutoring or whatever they need. And it follows a lot of the Steiner, Rudolf Steiner. So it's the mind, body, will of the child and that type of curriculum. But the space itself that was created, this founder, this husband, wife team, it's about six years old now. You know, she's um, she's been trained in Juilliard and expression and they have children of their own. But she also she gifts crystals. She's she believes in a child's voice, um, equal opportunity. Uh, you just feel that all the children there lead with their their chat like there and and when you see a child I'm jumping around a little bit but we had an instant this week where a child started going inward a little bit there's usually an educator that takes them on a walk and just lets them talk you know like I've done that before I put my hands on my back just out of habit and I'm like strolling and letting them get things out and you don't see that in normal schools you see boxes and you see desks and rules and this kind of um yeah, we just we just didn't want this. So this type of place, the classes are small. Even the fifth grade, I think, has five kids. Our fourth grade that I work in has 18. It's one of the bigger ones. And the middle school is sixth, seventh, and eighth. They're all together in this one 24-kid class. Um, but they everything, every learning block is hands-on. Because you have the analytical thinkers writing essays, then you have the artists like my daughter drawing the pictures to go with the essays, and then you have the presenters. You, she honors all of that as part of a curriculum. We, the, we it has not gone to the point of Aramis, and why I'm so ad admirable of Aramis and that program. I know is meant to be seed everywhere. Um, is it would be nice to have more. Um, of the metaphysical and you know really dive deep into that stuff but i find that those who gravitate towards that kind of knowledge they're finding this place so a lot of our community members are already those type of healers and educators and they're holding little classes and at their homes outside of school um, and we also get those that are newly awakening or saying i don't know my i just feel like this is the best place for my child i don't know why but it's like they're being called there. And then there's those that are, you know, believe in this, some of the old systems like medical or what have you, but their child is activating the parent going, but I want to be here. Like they're, they're okay. They're medically, but they're thinking they're consciously able to see all the sides to it. Whereas before, again, they'd be put in a box. So the best thing I have to say about this place and I, is that I, in the times that we've gone and this goes for most days when it comes to schooling my kids, they want to be there. There's never a, oh, I got to go. You know, it's, it's like they can't wait to go. And then the children can't, you know, when they leave, they're always like, bye, everybody. You know, they love being there. And that goes for most of the kids I work with there. They're happy being there. And that, to me, is a sign of a special place. Um, even the owners asked a couple of us to set intentions there and ground the place every day and literally put force fields like we're we are protecting this space because we know we are creating the new earth that we're all dreaming of and that we all envision and it starts somewhere. And so we're just trying to protect the kids um, internally, like without them, they don't even know we are. We're just giving them a really great rad space to learn in, but we are very viciously, fiercely, I should say, not viciously, um, protective of this, of just their mind, body, and will. We're literally hand over heart and head. We're like, are these children well and safe and blooming and um, expanding? And that's our goal. Our goal is to get them to expand to where they're like, hey, I'm really good at this. Or um, like, like whenever there's an issue, there's counsel. The children talk to each other. And this is all ages. 
Um, they're like, if someone's feelings are hurt, they get to it. It's very tribal. You know, I know that's very old school, ancient tribes. When, when one tribe member gets hurt by another, or he does something wrong, the tribe comes together and lifts them up again. Cause they're like, well, you did something wrong because there's darkness on you or an entity, or this isn't you, you're a good person. And they lift them. We're about lifting these kids. And um, it's just magical. Yeah. I took like 800% pay cut <laughs> and I'm, and I'm happier than ever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's funny. It's funny. It's not really, it's funny, but not so funny. The things in our society that are truly the most important are the careers that get paid the, the less and the least. I know. And I think that that's something that people should be like, this is a huge red flag. You know, why do our teachers get paid? Nothing. Um, uh, you know, the, the educators are, are the most important. They're teaching our children who are the future and then the future and the future, you know, like it's, it's, it's crazy to me. But one of the things you mentioned that I think is really important and we don't have this in the traditional schools um, is conflict resolution. Children are not taught how to work through differences, different opinions and different, even different religious backgrounds or, or not, you know, I was just talking about this this morning to someone about my daughter for the first time ever. And it and, and happens to be in Florida here recently, she was made fun of because we as a family are not religious. We don't go to church. I am so open-minded though. Like I don't judge anybody, whatever your religion is. I honor that it's a personal choice. I truly believe that regardless of how I feel. Um, so there happens to be a lot of religious, you know, we're in the South, you know, everybody goes to church here and we don't, I think we're like one of the only ones. And recently she was made fun of by a couple of kids because they said, oh, you don't even know who Mother Mary is. You don't go to church. And they were literally making fun of her. And she came oh. home very upset about it. She said, mommy, like, who's Mother Mary? And I was like, and, and, and why are they saying I should know her? And it broke my heart. Not because she doesn't know who Mother Mary is, but the whole premise of why she was being made fun of. And this is what I believe is a true problem in our world. Because everybody is, is taught to be so closed-minded. And if you're not in this package that they're in or they follow their beliefs then you you know there's something wrong she even had a friend recently that her mom said she wasn't allowed to play with Aramis outside of school because we didn't belong to their church and she's not allowed to play with anyone outside of the church and I was like oh okay you know and I tried to work through that with Aramis I said that's their beliefs we have to respect that try I'm trying to help her understand but it's a challenge right now. And I think that they need to understand that it's okay to be different. And the conflict resolution, I believe is, is paramount right now. Do you guys have anything like that in your school or how do you navigate? Yeah. I know you just gave like one example, but it, yeah. like, I think this is a big thing. It's such a big thing. And I think the hardest thing is to let anything fester for too long. So things get, you know, not necessarily solved right away, but attention taken to it. If mm -hmm. that means conflict between children, um, like in our fourth, we do have a kid that, you know, in my mom hat needs a little more attention. He's just craving it. There's a new baby at home. Like it all lines up. I get why there's a moment. And the compassionate way the lead teacher and I do it is we are making note of situations. And of course, if any other child, there's danger involved, we step in. But what we want to do is present to the parent what we've been witnessing and how can we help? How can we assist? We've tried moving desks. We've had a conversation. Miss Heidi takes them for walks. You know, we're trying these things and we're trying to work with the family and say, we know he's better. We know that he has no in, ill intent. There's something else here. How can we help? So it's more of a, your kid's like this. You know what I mean? It's not like your kid is like this, so fix it. Or go home and go, or if there's a dispute between two children, they're like, your kids are fighting. Go take this off campus and figure it out. We're as educators stepping and going, what can we do here, guys? You know, it looks like there's a lot. And then we have to assess all the things. Is there a new child at home? Is there a divorcing? Is there, you know, some there's because there's always a lot of layers to this there. The kids are reacting to their life. They're not ill children that want to hurt. They're they learn everything the way that it's presented to them. So how they behave, they're not there's no bad child. There's kids that need um, an understanding group of adults that want to work with them and help balance their nervous system and 
And I think we do that pretty well. Um, we did have some instances last year in a different grade, my son's grade, where even though the center um, couple, the husband and wife that created the space, you know, they take all the councils too. They go to all the sit downs. They want to know what's happening in their community. And they always lead from the heart and they stay in the heart. And if it gets out of control in that sense, they bring it back to the heart. But the incidences in this class are, it became cutthroat. It was a lot of outside chatter, like on telegram threads about the school, like gossip. And it got so festery out there that when it came in for counsel, it couldn't even sustain, like it was dissolved. And a lot of those families left because it's such a high vibration there that it was like, we're not even entertaining this hearsay you know, let's get to the root of the problem, which is A, B, and C. And you families are having a conflict over this other thing. It's, it's, it was, I loved how they handled it because basically they're like, well, this is the vibration we're holding here. Can you meet us here? And some of the families wound up leaving. And with that being said, we wish the children, some of the children well, because we're like, we knew they were trying. Um, wait, that was two stories as well. So basically there's always an educator involved when the conflicts um, get discussed, but there's, if a kid comes up and says, so-and-so did this to me, it's not taken lightly. It's also not an assumption that this other child did something to them. It's a, oh, tell me what was going on with you. Now let's get the other party involved. Why don't you tell me what's going on with you? How did that make you guys feel? Sounds really psychological and everything, but it kind of, it is. It's getting them to talk more about what they're feeling. Um, I guess it's a roundabout way of doing it, but I, from being there this year, I've only been in the, in the center since September. So it's, you know, this is my first full year there. The, the last year I just dropped them off my kids off and picked them up. I wanted them to get a break from me. <laughs> and, but every time I went on campus and then I heard the stories going on behind the scenes, I'm like, they need some more, wait, they need some more um, <laughs> people in there. They need some more light in there. And it was an easy decision to step in. So watching these lead educators and how they handle the kids, it's like, I mean, I, I, if, if this were the norm, if this was a public school, I think there goes any sort of <laughs> future is, issue we could possibly have because they're teaching children to stand in their truth and be true to who they are, but respect the other person standing in their truth. And that, you don't see that very much. Sometimes you don't even see that in people's houses. <laughs> yeah, we're not taught that, Heidi. That's the problem. And it's like, you know, we're a bunch of adults acting like toddlers, you know, most of the time. And we don't know how to respect boundaries. We don't know how to work through conflict. We don't know how to respect that somebody else's truth might not be yours, but that's still okay. And that's why my biggest objective in Aramis Learning Centers or just advocating for new educational opportunities. You know, what you're, what you're in and what others are doing is giving these children a voice, but also keeping the compassion element and keeping them humble. I teach my daughter every day because she's the one in the house that I have to remind. My boys, they're, their personalities, they're very compassionate, empathic, they care, they're very sensitive. They're uber compassionate about others. Where my daughter, she lacks a little bit of empathy, I think, because she's so headstrong She's a leader. She wants to be in charge. She thinks she knows everything. And so sometimes she forgets that you can hurt other people with your actions or with your words or your, your lack of consideration. And I have to wheel her in and teach her humility and being humble. So it's a, it's a delicate balance. But I think if, if imagine if everybody went through those developmental years of elementary, middle, and into high school, they went out into the world having these fundamentals and these tools and how to work through it, we, we would be and we will be a completely different society. And I think that's what this ascension is all about. And that's why mm -hmm. I'm so happy to hear so many people are focusing their attention on children. And I have people that I work with that want to volunteer that don't even have children. They just want to help the children. They value children. Oh, I never had the opportunity to have children. I want to help. You know, so it doesn't have to be, it's not just the parents out there. It's people right. in general. If you know if you value this planet and where we are going in the future, even if it doesn't even connect to you in a conscious way, uh, because you don't have anybody to, to leave behind when you, when you cross, 
you still value, you have value in knowing yeah. that the children are the future of keeping these things going forward. And I think that yeah. it's a beautiful thing. Yeah, I, I always say too, exactly. It doesn't have to be parents we're speaking to. I would say that on Raising Starseeds all the time. You're everyone's a guardian of a parent of a child because we all cohabitate this planet. But also I think of those children that I've had just run-ins at the grocery store or just any place a child could be looking at an adult and in that you don't know what they're going through at that time but if you're shining bright if you see them and recognize them and smile like just those tiny little things shift them and so in that sense we're all in, in charge and have responsibility to these kids at this point because they, they just went through a very crazy tumultuous two three year thing that is still going on in some places and they're looking at us they're looking at us to show them that everything's gonna be okay you know we're good you're fine you got a bright light i can see you and that alone can shift things i remember when this was really strong and i would go out without and i'd see a kid in their eyes and just the light off and i would just smile like i pretend they didn't even have it on them and i just be like well i'd be like well, look at those fun shoes you know how fun you know you, you know you must be a good dancer something something silly i'll say to them and just the light just the beaming and i'm like those little things add up and they're all so, so very important. So when you get them around and why our education systems are so important is because I watch, um, we have relatives out here and we have people we know within the systems and I see what their kids struggle with. Most of it, aside from the very controlled academics, which we don't have to get into, most of their struggles are social. And you're dealing with kids from so many different households and what they the rules are and what what is approved for them. But they're struggling socially because as they try to work their things out at school, again, there's rules, there's sit, there's hierarchy, there's class systems, there's all these little things that I think are just, that's just too much for a small, just for for children in development. So to, to teach them when they're young that they have a voice, that they have a truth, that they come with everything intact and they're perfect as is pretty much, you know, just giving them a platform to be like, I hear you, I see you, um, how can I help is just sacred. It's sacred at this point. And it's something that really any space can do. We have the Aramis, we have this particular center, um, there's forest schools all over, there's the backyard pods, there's all these opportunities where we have where we can reshape the way we're doing things and be okay with it. There's the, I was trained, I was trained until my kids were born. Well, then we got to go to this school in our neighborhood and then they're going to go to this high school and, and then there's got to be a university. I don't even, I doubt that now. I'm like, let's get them into some trades and skills and, you know. Well, we started on that. Oh, my God. I, know. I am so <laughs> against thing. that. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone knows my opinion on that. But then, you know, my son is graduating high school and his dad is like, has been pushing him. Where, where, where college are you going to? And I'm like, I don't want you to go to college. Like, it's a waste of money. And it's I don't even think they're going to exist in, 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 the, in a few years. And the, I don't the degrees don't mean anything. I'm like, what do you want to do? Let's find you a trade school. Like that's the future. The future are trade schools. I truly yes. believe that. I don't want him to waste his time and I don't want to waste our money either uh, on these on these indoctrination camps because it's just a continuation of high school. Yes. But um, and money anyway, laundering and all that stuff. All sorts of, <laughs> we don't even we don't even need to get it. I know. Oh my but gosh. there's a way showing we can teach them that like I told my kids with motion picture like I used my skills and I merged all my loves entertainment snacks, you know, all this stuff and then their stepdad he's in it and he came from not having the experience but he trained himself on one piece of equipment and now he's it's a beautiful salary you can't get that kind of salary at university yeah I truly wholeheartedly believe in the mentorships and the trades, and that's what we're preparing them for. Who are you? What do you like to do? You know, what makes your heart sing? Where is your skill set at? Oh, I have a mentor for you. I know how, like, you know, and then guide them. We're guiding children to yeah. a newer you know, paradigm. What I think is the biggest challenge right now, too, is the, the 18 to 20, mid 20 bracket, maybe even in early 30s, who knows, that I'm seeing in the last three to five years in my sessions is that these children, um, 
don't want to go into the traditional workforce because there isn't anything out there that is suitable for them. They don't want to do anything that's out there. They don't want to go to school because there's nothing that's interesting for them to study. And what I was told many times over and over is the job that they're meant to do isn't ready yet. It's not invented. We're not ready for that. So they're they're kind of in this weird, awkward in between where they're in between two realities. And so they're just waiting until something comes. And these poor parents that are like thinking that their parent, their children are are, you know, they're they're being called losers from societal norms of being in the mom's basement and playing video games all day. Um, to not having any motivation to do anything, can't figure out what they want to do and getting depressed, having anxiety. You know, I feel like a majority of those are just the way showers of what's to come. And we just aren't there yet. We're just not quite there yet. And I think my son is one of those. He doesn't want to go to school. He can't figure out for the life of him. I'm like, Jordan, if money didn't matter, what would you do? He's like, I don't know, mom. I, I really don't know. And I'm like, well, that's okay. I don't mind. I said, as long as you are trying to figure it out and, and not just, you know, playing video games all day, like have a purpose in this world, uh, you know, just figure out what your passions are. But I think that um, society has been too much focused, these children too much on these are your options and that's it. But that's not true. A lot of those options are one going to be away soon and new ones will come. So it's we're in this weird, awkward period. What do you think about that? Oh, I'm a thousand percent with you and I see it. And what resonates big time is when you say it's not there yet. And that's what I believe is that's why we're on the transition team. We are really literally trying to way show and say there's another way of doing things because it's not a big sweeping role of of uh, a generation that's flipping. It's just slowly trickling out right now. And like the mentorships and the skill sets and the trades, that's maybe where these, once these kids find their true gift, become an educator in it. You know, what is your passion? Video games? Cool. Teach a kid coding, you know, teach it, you know, create your own video game. Like they're, 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 been programmed not by their parents not by you I'm saying but there is a societal programming of making money for somebody else and I'm trying to reteach my kids to like be the boss (laughs) be your own boss (laughs) and give freely and service to others you to get a skill set in a trade with a certain in a service to others mindset um, that's where if you do what you love the money will come my dad trained me with that (laughs) and so I just I just feel like, yeah, there's this pause. It feels like a pause. Like we're all catching our breath after that big wave. And now there's a pause here. And then we're going to shift into this more mentorship skills trades thing. And maybe their lights will start popping. Well, I am really good at this. Well, I am really good at this. And they create their own little businesses. Um, But the mentorships, what I see too, and this is friends of mine that are being really called to work with teens now is um, the teens being perhaps a little lost, but they need their mentors. It's not a parent and perhaps not a professor or something like someone in their own craft or just someone that speaks teen just to hold that extra space for them. So that like my daughter, maybe there's something she's just not going to fully expressed to me yet because I am mom so they need mentors and mentors to me are the late teens 20s 30s you know show be a little bit show them how you're navigating your life and um which is exciting because in this day and age with tech everybody can do that now everybody's vlogging and showing their travels and their journeys and I mean TikTok videos and filters aside, there's a really cool way to really express yourself and share your human experience. And, you know, our teens could probably be looking up to that now and seeing another way. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's incredible. I mean, the good, there's a good and bad to everything. And the good thing about the internet and the Zoom and the interfacing across the world is that you could have a mentor in another country if you needed to. You know, you're not restricted to where you live anymore. And I think that's one of the good things that came out of the, you know, the pandemic um, yeah. was that it, it, it broadened our horizons a little bit. <clears throat> and I think that's a beautiful thing because unfortunately, previous generations coached their children. And I think there still are to pick a career based on money. How can you yeah. provide for your family? <clears throat> in my personal opinion, although probably important, um, is so misguided because ch- I, I see this every day. People, these kids choose something that their mom and dad want them to do lawyer, doctor, you know, the money makers, which in reality they're really not. 
um, and they get in so much debt by the time they are achieve that title, but that's a whole other thing that they're not happy and they're making money, but they're not fulfilled and they're miserable. I work with these people in their 50s, 60s, 70s. They said, I hated my life. I made money, but I was never happy. And I wish I had always, I loved art or I was a mu- I wish I could have been a musician. And they have all of these, I wish I had done moments. And I don't want to, our children to have that experience. I want them, to, I want to encourage them to say, you know, Jordan does the same thing. I'm like, who taught you that? Because he's like, you know what, what job can I do that makes money? And I'm like, no, you're doing it wrong. I'm, I'm, t- I'm not, I don't say it like that, but I'm like, Jordan, <laughs> something that you like because you want to do it. I promise the money will come later. Don't worry about the money. I want you to do something that makes you happy. Um, I don't want you to just be a lawyer because you think, oh, I'll make a lot of money. You have to really like to be a lawyer and then you might make money and maybe you won't. Um, I, but I think that there's a, there's a there's a delicate line of coaching them right now to find their way and, and not be so focused on money. But that's a really hard thing because we're still in that 3D matrix of money right now, but we are moving out of it. But a lot of people don't see that or don't know it. So they're coaching their children the way that they were coached. And it's yeah. causing a lot of destruction, anxiety, and depression amongst oh, our team yeah. right now. Oh, gosh, I, I really do see that. And again, with the transparency, as I've been with my own kids, um, when I worked motion picture before the stepfather came in, there was some survival mode because I wanted to be the primary caregiver. So I worked part time on set, but I made a full time salary. So the great money, leftover groceries, all this stuff, but I was frazzled. And even the times I was home, I wasn't home. I was constantly thinking of the next job and stuff. So we literally talked and outweighed, you know, which was bet, which is worth it. Mom at home and we're getting by, you know, like it's not, but I'm at peace, less stress. We're not, the financial just goes out the window, but is it me being at home, not stress or me out the window stress? And then we can have all the money. It was a big choice to see. We'd rather have you at home. I'm like, awesome. So as you see, I certainly don't, I prefer it as well. I'm not chasing a paycheck now. I'm chasing peace. I want, I do not want to disrupt my own system anymore. I, I couldn't survive. So I always said that pandemic, that was, I'm like, thank you. <laughs> you gave me a gift. When I had a chance to walk away, I got my life back. So that was a big deal. And I get to show them that now. Yeah. A lot of people did too. So a lot of good came out of it. It's not all bad. You know, there's a good and a bad to everything, a yin and a yang, yeah. but Oh, Heidi, this has been such a wonderful conversation. I, I'm so grateful for you and our friendship, even though we're on two opposite ends of the country, um, I still think you are fabulous and everything that you're doing is wonderful. And you're holding space over there. I'm holding space over here. Everyone that's watching and attracted to this channel and this content is holding space where they are too, which is beautiful and valuable. Um, is there anything else you want to say, or do you want to let people know how they can get a hold of you or where your social media is or anything like that? Oh, sure. Well, just thank you again very much. This is a super treat. I've, I've always seen you spearheading the movement. And what I think is there's never enough people that can talk about this kind of stuff. So um, more the merrier and let's, let's do this. Let's light this up. Let's show the kids how to do this. Um, for me, I'm on all the socials. I've been trolling on there since they, since MySpace. <laughs> <laughs> so I think you can still find my MySpace, but I do have a link tree. I think that was easy to bundle everything. It's like link tree slash Heidi pop. And, um, I do my YouTubes and rumble and I vlog a lot. I, I have three little uh, video series. I'm doing the homeschool mom series. Um, which is so fun because it's just everyday homeschool moms sharing their journey. And um, then we have the high vibe hangouts. I love seeing people way show and just live like following their bliss and how, what that looks like. And then a kid's health thing. I, I hang with my old buddy, my old roommate, and we do this kid's health series and all those are on rumble and YouTube and, but link tree, you can find all my stuff and social media. I'm on there. They, they sub- try as they may to suppress me, <laughs> but I'm on there. <laughs> well, I'll put your, I'll put all your links below. And um, I, and good point. If I have a lot of parents that that follow me, that write to me, that are my clients that are newly homeschoolers or thinking about it or have been for a while, but still looking for ideas and this and that. So your that your channel will be a great resource for them to come in and listen in and see what you guys are talking about. Um, and and so I'm going to put that in there as well. Um, thank you, Heidi, so much for coming on. Thank you to thank everybody you. watching this episode of Journey of a Starseed. Our children are the future. They're so important. 
and we are trying to bring uplifting conversations and things that are of, of value, what we believe is of value right now, what we should be focusing our attention on as opposed to some of the other darker stuff. So thank you to everyone for joining in. Um, bye until next time, everybody. Bye. bye. See you soon. Thank you.